My name is Kevin Watkins. I'm Director of the Education for All Global Monitoring Report, uh, which is produced annually by UNESCO. And this is the Education 101 lecture. I want to start by just saying a few words about the Education for All agenda. That's the UN framework for education. It's a little bit broader than the Millennium Development Goal framework. As, as a lot of you will know, the second Millennium Development Goal sets a target of universal primary education by 2015. And there is a, there's another goal that, uh, uh, that, that aims at gender parity in, in education. The education for all system is a little bit broader. It includes what happens to children before they get into school, that is to say the early childhood agenda. It includes learning achievement and the quality of education, in other words, what, what kids get out of going into school. But it also includes uh, measurements of progress and setting benchmarks in areas like adult literacy, technical and vocational education and training, and uh, the financing uh, of education. So I want to start off by just making a few general observations about why education is so critical. Mark Twain once said that his real education was about forgetting everything that he'd learned in school. But for millions of kids around the world, getting into school and getting a decent education is what really shapes your opportunities in life. And if you think about why education is so central to the whole Millennium Development Goal framework, just think about the links from education to some of the other goals. We have one of the Millennium De Development Goals, which is about halving extreme poverty by 2015. Now, if you want to halve extreme poverty, you need two things. You need economic growth, and you need poor people to share equitably in the benefits of growth. Education is one of the most powerful drivers for economic growth around the world. That's true for rich countries and for poor countries. And we know from the data and the analysis of many countries around the world that it's people without education who are getting left behind. So if we can't deliver education to people living in poverty, if we can't move rapidly towards universal primary education in the world's poorest countries, those two critical ingredients of more accelerated economic growth and fairer distribution are, are going to be missing. <clears throat> education is also, of course, a basic human right in and of itself. It's something that people have a claim to, an entitlement to. It's a provision in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, and that's another reason for putting it right at the top of the Millennium Development Goal uh, agenda. We know from many of the other indicators for measuring progress that it's people and parents with education who are in the best position to expand opportunities for themselves and for their children. If you take some very basic indicators about child survival, having a mother who has been to secondary school more or less cuts by a factor of three to four the chances of children dying before the age of five. So if you want to cut child mortality by two thirds, which is one of the Millennium Development Goals, ensuring that girls get into school today in order to improve child survival prospects tomorrow is absolutely critical, it's a key investment. And of course we know that education is one of the key factors in political accountability. People who are deprived of basic literacy and numeracy skills are not well placed to hold their governments to account. And that's why you, when we think about governance systems and good governance, we really need to think about education as part of that overall framework as well. Now, I want to take you pretty quickly through some of the key education for all goals. And then I want to come back to, you know, what are some of the big impediments to progress? So I, I want to start off by saying something about the progress that we've made, how far we have to go, look at, look at some of the good news and some of the bad news. And then I want to focus on the community in the world that's being left behind, the most marginalized people in the world. Let's start with early childhood. Often when people think about progress in education, they, th they start from what happens to kids when they're in primary school. What is the intake rate into primary school? 
what is the transition rate from primary school into secondary school, and those types of indicators. And of course, th those things are really important. But equally important is the condition of children when they go into school. And around the world, there is something, there's something like 178 million kids every year who, go, who start their primary school career carrying the burden of extreme malnutrition. That is to say, they've experienced acute hunger at some stage in the first five years of their life, usually during the first two years of their life. And, and that really matters, not just because of the suffering that it inflicts on those children, not just because of the enhanced uh, exposure to risk of infectious disease that, that, it, that, that, it, that it creates, but also because we know from many studies that once a child has been malnourished, it interrupts their cognitive development. And we know that the consequence of that track children all the way through school, that kids who have been malnourished perform uh, at far lower levels in terms of memory tests, uh, in terms of uh, writing, in terms of numeracy, than kids who haven't been malnourished. So if you want to secure a proper return from investments in, in education, if you want real opportunity, e e real equality of opportunity in education, tackling that crisis of malnutrition before the kids get into school is absolutely critical. We know for many children that the disadvantages that come with acute malnutrition actually begin in the womb. That is to say, it starts with the malnutrition of their mothers. That's an es especially a big concern in South Asia, where iron deficiency and micronutrient deficiency is extremely widespread. It affects something like 40% of pregnant women in the South Asian region as a whole. And that has implications for the development of children in the womb. It has implications for children being born underweight. And again, we know that children who are born underweight, if you pick up their test scores seven years later, 10 years later, even 15 years later, you can still see the, uh, a, a big disadvantage, uh, a, nu a nutrition-related disadvantage. That's why in, our rep in the UNESCO Education for All Global Monitoring report, we attach an awful lot of weight to joining up the health agenda and the education agenda. If you want to see kids flourishing in school, you need to make sure they're properly nourished before they get into school. And if you want to make sure they're properly nourished before they get into school, you need to, you need to ensure that their, their mothers are properly nourished during pregnancy. And there are many things that need to happen in order to facilitate that uh, maternal and child health agenda. But absolutely critical in this context is the removal of fees on basic maternal and child health care. Many countries continue to charge mothers for antenatal services. Uh, that has very adverse consequences for attendance uh, at clinics and, 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 and access to the services that um, mothers and children need in, in order to flourish. We've seen, on the other hand, that when those fees are withdrawn in countries like um, Senegal, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, it really opens the door to the health system to, to mothers with uh, significant improvements for child and maternal health. Many governments around the world are now recognizing that if you want to tackle disadvantage in education, you have to start before kids get into school. That was actually one, one of the central tenets of President Johnson's uh, Head Start programs in, in the United States right back in the 1960s, that if you want to break this link between poverty on the one side and education disadvantage on the other, you have to start early, before the, the age of five. And many developing country governments are, are also now trying to expand their, their early childhood education systems. But enrollment into those systems remains very low, and it also remains very unequal. If you look at uh, a country like Egypt, children from the wealthiest 20% of households in that country are 25 more times more likely to be in an early childhood class than children from the poorest backgrounds. Now that is a, a huge disadvantage for the poor, and of course it's precisely the poor who face the risks of malnutrition and who need the, the additional support that an early childhood education can provide. Uh, I want to turn now to universal primary education, which is one of the areas where the Education for All agenda 
and the Millennium Development Goal agenda uh, meet. If you look at the one of the core indicators for progress towards universal primary education, it's the number of children who are out of school. And we've seen significant progress in this area over the past 10 years. Uh, out of school numbers have dropped by something like 28%. And that's very significant. But I, I want to turn to some bad news within that general good news story. If you looked at the global picture for who was out of school back, in, uh, back at the end of, of the 1990s, at the, the uh, start of 2000, we had something like 105 million kids who were out of school. The vast majority of those kids were in Southwest, South and West Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And what we've seen in the decade since is a really steady improvement. So out of school numbers are now down to about 72 million. That's, that's a big step forward. You can see from that chart that the step forward, however, has been very uneven. And it's been uneven in two respects, which is that the biggest gains have happened in South Asia and West Asia, especially in countries like India and Bangladesh, which has been particularly successful in cutting gender disparities in, in education. Africa's also been making progress, and re really quite significant progress, because the primary school population of sub-Saharan Africa has increased by something like uh, 20 million over that period, and yet the out-of-school numbers are, are coming down. So that's a real testament to progress in, in sub-Saharan Africa. You can see also that the progress is uneven over time. We had this very big dip in out-of-school numbers between about 2002 and 2005. But after then, the trend starts flattening out. And more recent, uh, more recent data point to a continuation of that slowdown. So we, we started to see a slowdown in the rate of progress around the middle uh, of this period. And, and, and that's continued. Now, if you project this forward, to 2015, it gives you an idea of where we might be if we carry on as we are. And this is what that projection looks like. You can see two things that come out of that story. The first is that we're an awful long way from hitting the target. We'll, we will still have over 50 million children out of school in, tw in 2015 as we, if we carry on as, as we are. The share of African children in that out-of-school number will continue to rise steadily uh, over time. And that, that's a major concern because Sub-Saharan Africa is already the most disadvantaged region of the world in terms of education. And in an increasingly knowledge-based global economy where prosperity, employment, progress in areas like uh, health and other social indicators depend critically on education, these education gaps that that graph captures in a very basic way will, of course, translate into gaps in global income distribution, in marginalization for the region, uh, and, and disadvantages in other areas as, as well. I, I should add to this general picture, which is not a good news picture, that the official data probably understate the scale of the problem. And that's because what the official data capture are the enrollment rates that are recorded at the start of a school year. In other words, they tell us about children going into school. If you actually look at what household survey data tell you about attendance in school, it turns out that there are typically far fewer children actually in school than are registered on, uh, on, on the school accounts and reported to governments. We, we estimate, in fact, that the understatement of the out-of-school population is probably in the range of 30 to 50 percent for most of the countries that, that, uh, that, that we've looked at in the report. I focus so far on the out-of-school numbers, and, and that out-of-school number is absolutely critical, but it's important to understand what do we mean by the term universal primary education? It seems like a very simple concept. Uh, 
but it turns out to be not quite as straightforward as we imagine. Uh, in a typical rich country, kids will go into primary school somewhere between the age of five and seven, and they'll stay in, and they'll stay in that school, they'll progress steadily through the system. If you look at the typical situation in a developing country, many kids go into school very late, and often they drop out very early. So the fact that you might enroll into school in year one doesn't actually tell you very much about your prospects for completing a full primary education cycle. And I want to illustrate that for you with the example of Nicaragua. So if we take the primary school age group in Nicaragua and we look at how many of that group actually enter primary school at, at the right time, it's something like 67%. Uh, that is to say around one third of Nicaraguan children of primary school age uh, are entering school later than they should or not entering school at all. But then if you track them through the system and you ask the question, well, how many of those kids actually get through to grade five, the survival rate to that grade is right down to 32%. That is to say only one third of that cohort are actually getting into school and progressing through school. And of course, getting into the last grade doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get through the last grade. And it turns out that only about one quarter of children get through the, the, the last grade. So you can see from that example just how serious the, the problem of retention in school is, as indicated by the high dropout rate. And in half of the countries of sub-Saharan Africa, one third or more of kids who go into school drop out before completing school. So th there's a twin challenge here with regard to access to school. And that challenge is, first of all, about getting kids who are out of school into the school system. The second challenge is about ensuring that once they're in the school system, they stay in the system and they progress steadily through the grades to have an opportunity of making it through to secondary school. I want to touch very briefly on some of the other aspects of the education for all agenda because, I mean, clearly education is not just about what goes on in primary school. Um, th there are two other goals, uh, three, goals three and four uh, on the in the education for all framework that deal with youth and adult skills and literacy. And these are, are both areas where we've seen progress, but, but at the same time, many problems. Uh, so far, I've been talking about primary school age children who don't make it through the system. But if you look at the adolescent age group, we have just as many kids in, in the adolescent age range, around 72 million, who are out of school. And of course, those are kids who are coming out of the education system and into employment markets and they're entering those markets lacking the basic resources that they really need to secure a decent job, decent employment, and work their way out of poverty. Technical and vocational training systems can provide these kids with a second chance, but once again, the evidence that we've got from many low-income countries across, uh, across South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa is that relatively few kids are getting into those technical, vocational, and training systems. And those that do get into the systems are often coming out lacking the basic skills uh, still that they need to secure uh, a job. We have the same problems in literacy uh, that we have in other areas. And, and indeed, literacy has really become a forgotten goal. Um, we've seen very limited progress. The ambition of cutting literacy rates by around one half, which is the target, um, mo most countries across the world are an awful long way off track for, for achieving that. And there's very little prospect of, of, of the big illiteracy countries, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, actually getting back on track uh, and, and achieving the target. However, we do know from the success of some major literacy programs in countries like Brazil, that rapid progress is possible.
Uh, I mentioned before that gender parity in education is one of the most critical goals. It's critical for education for all framework and for the Millennium Development Goal framework, but it's critical above all because it's a basic human right. The idea um, that your gender should determine your opportunity in, in education is, is not one that most people would accept. And yet, if you look at the state of the world, although we have seen a big decline in gender inequalities, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, to some extent in South Asia, we're still around six million girls away from gender parity. That is to say, if we had the same proportion of girls in school as boys, there would be six million more girls in school. And there are 28 countries in the world that have nine uh, that for every 10 boys in school, there are only nine girls or fewer. That is a very significant gender gap. The, the, the final education for all goal that I want to mention in, in passing relates to the quality of education. It goes without saying, I think, that most parents want their kids to go to school for what they learn. Just being in school isn't, isn't an end in itself. It's a means to learning and it's a means for building the skills and getting opportunities to go into secondary education. And yet we know from the evidence of many countries, in particularly in the poorest parts of the world, that the quality of education is letting an awful lot of kids down. They're coming out of school, in many cases, having completed a full primary cycle, lacking basic numeracy skills and lacking basic literacy skills. There are studies from India and Pakistan which show that the majority of children in grade three are unable to subtract simple one-digit sums to give you an illustration of just how serious the quality problem is. And if you look at what that means on a global scale, you know, we often look at inequalities in education in terms of years in school or enrollment rates in secondary education. But if you look at this graph, it shows you, uh, this is from an international learning assessment survey called TIMS. The horizontal line uh, demarks where the lowest benchmark for performance, in other words, kids who are performing below that line are performing below what is regarded in the assessment as an absolutely minimal level of achievement. And if you look at the OECD countries over on the left-hand side of the graph, you can see that there are very tiny populations who fall in, into that category. But if you look over to the right-hand side of the graph, you can see that in a country like Ghana, 90% uh, of eighth grade students are actually performing at below that lowest benchmark level. Now, once again, if you bear in mind that we're moving towards or, or we're living in an increasingly knowledge-based global economy and you have such a big proportion of kids who are in school who are learning at, at that sort of level and you compare their learning achievement with kids in rich countries, these populations in future will be competing in the global marketplace and once again these inequalities and disparities in education uh, will have consequences for uh, success in areas like international trade and will have implications for the uh, global distribution of income. So I, I want to turn now to this key issue that it's a pretty bleak picture out there if we look at the rate of progress towards the goals that the international community has set itself and it immediately raises the question well you know who is it who's being left behind and why are they being left behind and what can we do to reach them? And I want to, I want to cover each of those areas in turn. Let, let's start with um, reaching the marginalized. One of the things that we've done in UNESCO is to develop a new measurement tool which we call the deprivation and marginalization in education measure. And we developed it not, not just to, to capture the level of disparities within countries, but in order to, to turn the spotlight on exactly who is being left behind and asking why they're being left behind. And I want to just spend a little bit of time explaining to you how this tool works, because I think it may be very relevant to many of you who are doing research in, in education. 
and are interested in these inequalities of opportunity. And I, I want to look then at some of the drivers of marginalization. What is it that is pushing some kids to the bottom of the end of the distribution for opportunities? And then to turn to some of the remedies. So let's start with the, the deprivation and marginalization in, in education tool. The first thing we do is to ask the question, how many children or what proportion of the children in a country um, have achieved less than four years in school? We look at this for the 17 to 22 year old age group because this is an age group which of course has been through the basic education cycle and it gives us a snapshot of, of what's happening in the education system that produced them, that they, that they have gone through. Why four years? Because we know from international evidence that if you have less than four years in school, you're very unlikely to emerge with the basic literacy and numeracy skills that you will need to um, flourish in society. We, we also look at another measure, which is the proportion of children with less than two years in school. And we treat this as an extreme education deprivation threshold. I think it goes without saying that if you have less than two years in school, um, you, you really have very little prospect later in life of having acquired the skills that you can use for gainful employment to improve your position and prospects in, in society. Um, we have a cluster of countries in the graph that you can see line up in different ways with respect to these two indicators. As you can see, if you go over to the right-hand side of the graph, you've got countries like Burkina Faso, Chad, Senegal, all of which have more than 50% of their 17 to 22-year-old population with less than four years in school. Over on the right-hand side, you've got countries like the Philippines, Turkey, Egypt, and Vietnam, where the numbers are much lower. But the next question to ask, of course, well, is uh, who is most likely, who, who faces the greatest risk in any society of getting less than four years in school? And one way of asking that is just to look at what's happening to the poorest 20%. This shows you for a small group of countries, what are the, what's the proportion of the poorest 20% with less than four years in school? And you can see in a country like Yemen, it goes up for that group from around 30% to 60%. In other words, being born poor roughly doubles your chances of getting less than four years uh, of, of school. And this is the, you can see the effect as it plays out for the, for the wider group of countries. But of course, it's not just poverty that matters. In many countries, it's gender as well. And if you ask yourself, if you ask what's happening to the poorest 20% of girls in these countries, you see another layer of deprivation. In other words, o over 90% of girls in Yemen who are born poor and female at the age of 17 to 22 have gained less than four years in school. So that, that gives you an insight into the scale of the wealth effect in education and the gender effect in education at a, at a broad national level. But I want to now mine down a little bit deeper by looking at a couple of specific countries because as I said one of the advantages of this measurement tool is that it, it enables you to look behind the big national numbers behind the national averages to ask exactly who is being left behind and how far are they being left behind so let's look at Nigeria and you can see at the bottom of this chart we've demarked the extreme education poverty line less than two years in school and the education poverty line, less than four years in school. And we've lined up a group of countries here where uh, on, on the y-axis, on, on the vertical axis, you've got, uh, av you've, you've got the years in school completed by the average 17 to 22 year old in that country. It runs from about 13 in Ukraine down to just over two in Chad. And if you put Nigeria on this scale, you can see it comes out on average at just under seven years. In other words, if you're, if you're born in Nigeria and you, you have average chances uh, in education, you're gonna get just under seven years in school. But of course, behind that average number, you've got very big differences. You've got a wealth gap 
So if you're born into the richest 20%, you're going to get almost 10 years in school, whereas if you're born into the poorest 20%, you're going to get just three and a half years in school. If you break that division down into the rural and urban sectors of society, you can see there's quite a small gap between the wealthy rural and wealthy urban people, age 17 to 22, but a very big gap between the urban and rural poor. Being rural poor puts you at a very big disadvantage compared to the rest of society, including the rest of uh, the, the poorest 20% in Nigeria. And you can see also there's a very big wealth gap that poor rural girls are right at the bottom of the pile on these, on these divisions, averaging less than three years in school. But then if you break that down again and you go to northern Nigeria and poor rural Hausa girls who live in the northern part of the country, the most educationally disadvantaged part of the country, you can see that this is a, a, a community or a constituency that averages less than half a year in school. In other words, if you're born into a poor Hausa family in northern Nigeria as a girl, you're really right, you're pushed right down towards the bottom of the global distribution of opportunity in education. Uh, th 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 this is true in, across many countries of the world. If you look at a country like Turkey, uh, you, you, can, you can see, again, the rural-urban split, the rich-poor split. But then cutting across these, you can identify one of the most marginalized groups in the country in terms of education are poor Kurdish girls who, on average, whereas Turkey as a whole uh, is averaging around eight years in education, poor Kurdish girls are averaging well uh, around three years and actually are performing at around the level of the average for a country like Chad. So in the midst of an OECD country, we, we are seeing education indicators for a sizable population group that would compare pretty unfavorably with many countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, these disadvantages that I'm describing in education and which the deprivation and marginalization index is picking up are overlapping. They don't exist in isolation. There's not a wealth effect that's separate from a gender effect. And both wealth and gender effects interact with other indicators for disadvantage whether you live in a rural area or an urban area, what language you happen to speak, in many countries what ethnic group you happen to come from. And I want to illustrate that by uh, a, taking a cluster of countries and looking at the risk of being in a state of extreme education deprivation in those countries. So if we look at the share the, the overall share of the population in this group of countries who are getting less than two years in school. You can see in Nigeria it's pretty high, it's around a quarter of the population. In Kenya it's around 8% of the population, much lower. In a country like Ghana it's 17%, India 20%. But then if you take particular groups in those countries, um, if we take Kenya, if you happen to be a rural Somali girl born into a poor household, 96% of those girls are going to have less than two years in education. That, that, that is a, an extraordinary level of inequality. It's almost as though there are two education systems within one country. One for, for pastoralist girls from poor households who are being left way behind everybody else and uh, an, another for the rest of society. And these measures are all important, I think, because they give us a window on that big global picture that I was setting up earlier. They partly help us to address the question of who's out of school, exactly where do they live, in many cases what language do they happen to speak, and uh, how do we identify them. So what are the underlying causes of some of these deprivation indicators that we're picking up? With that, with that measurement tool. Of course, we need to avoid overgeneralization in this area because every, what all of these groups have in common 
is that they're highly marginalized and they're being left way behind the rest of, the, of their country. But they all face very distinctive and different types of problems. And if we want to resolve the problems, the first step, of course, is to understand them. So what, what are the key themes that we, we pick up from our analysis of, of who's being left behind? We, we, we think you can broadly divide this into five key areas. Some of the effects are linked to overall poverty and vulnerability. And of course, it's poverty that drives children from many of the poorest countries into child labor. And there's a lot of evidence that uh, children who are pushed into child labor uh, are going to face really diminished prospects of, uh, of, of getting a decent education. There are specific group-based disadvantages. If you happen to be born into an ethnic minority, if you happen to be born into an indigenous group in many countries in Latin America, it carries with it a, a much higher risk of educational deprivation. So we need to understand what's going on within these groups. There are a whole range of location and livelihood specific problems. It's an obvious thing to say, but if you're born in, in a slum area, you're much more likely to be out of school. You're much less likely to progress through primary school if you, if you do manage to get into school and much less likely to get into secondary school. And there are some livelihoods, in particular the case of pastoral farmers, which I've already mentioned, which, carry, which appear to carry with it an increased risk uh, of being out of education. There are wider factors as well, which I'm not going to go into detail here, but in the, the evidence from many poor countries shows that there are significant groups, for example, disabled children who are much less likely to get into the education system, or children who have been orphaned by uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, who lack the parental support, who often lack the resources to, to get into the education system. So I, I started off by mentioning poverty as one of the biggest barriers to education. And we have still over one billion people in the world who are living on less than $1.25 a day. And if you look within these households, this of course is where the problem of child labor is very heavily concentrated. There are around 116 million children of school going age who are, aren't in school but are working. And what's pushing them out of school and into work, of course, is their household poverty. And in some cases, it's poverty which is created by external, specific external shocks. For example, a sickness episode in the household, the price of a commodity falls, a father loses their job. Now, for, for a family that's living below the poverty line, it's very unlikely to have the assets or the resources that they need to deal with that sort of shock without making very tough and often damaging decisions for, for long-term household welfare. You can cut nutrition, you can cut basic spending in other areas, or you can take children out of school. And all too often, of course, families are forced to make that, uh, that choice of taking kids out of school. Um, we know from the data in many countries that being born into a linguistic or ethnic minority group carries an enormous disadvantage. Indigenous people in a country like Guatemala, on average, are getting less than half of the years in school as non-Indigenous people. That's a very big gap which is connected to the, uh, to, 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 to the group that they happen to be part of, to the language they happen to speak at, uh, at home. We know from the evidence in India that the children who are most likely to be, be left behind are low caste children uh, from poor households, particularly in rural areas. Now, this is an area in which there are many aspects of group-based marginalization which have big consequences for education. If you look at the experience of many countries in Latin America, language has often been one of the tools of cultural domination and subordination. And that's reflect that has historically been reflected in education systems, which, for example, may only offer teaching in Spanish, which may not be the home language, which is not the home language spoken by indigenous people. We know from the evidence of studies in India that if you're born into a low caste home, 
and you're in a school with children who aren't from the same background as you, but it come from a higher caste background, that if your caste is actually announced when learning assessments are going on, children are less likely to perform well. They're less likely to perform well because of the lack of confidence and the stigmatization in that case that comes with uh, being born into a low caste household and the experience of being a low caste person. There is something like uh, 900 million people in the world who are living in slums. And living in a slum, of course, carries many disadvantages which have relevance for education. Parents are likely to be poor and may not be in a position to afford education. Children are more likely to be sick. But in many cases, slum dwellers are also, are also living in informal settlements. And living in informal settlements may mean that they don't have a registered titled property right. And that may in turn deprive them of their entitlement to an education because the funding of schools is often linked to uh, a title to property rights and, and so on. So that carries a very big disadvantage. I've already mentioned the issues of disability and HIV AIDS, which are widespread problems, particularly in the case of HIV AIDS in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where many children uh, are living every day with the consequences of having been orphaned and the lack of support that that results in. What are some of the remedies, the things that governments can do across the world to tackle these issues of marginalization? We, what, one way of thinking about this is in the form of a policy triangle. Um, there are things that governments can do to enhance access and affordability, to make schools more affordable for poor children, to ensure that classrooms are available to poor children and so on. There are things that governments can do to enhance the learning environment, to ensure that kids who get into class really get a chance to learn in class. And there are things that need to happen much more broadly to tackle the underlying causes of disadvantage that kids take with them into the education system. Just to mention a couple of, of, of points in each of these areas. If we take the learning environment, we know that children, particularly during the first three years of their education, really need to be taught in the language with which they're most familiar, that is to say, their home language. And in many countries across the world that have introduced home language teaching, uh, Vietnam, Bolivia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, we've actually seen quite significant improvements in uh, test, score, test scores within the school system. Of course, in order to teach children in their home language, you have to recruit teachers who can speak that language. That means focusing more on recruiting teachers from indigenous minority groups. And we've seen a very big push in countries like um, Peru and Bolivia in Latin America to create teacher training colleges for training indigenous teachers and creating incentive systems to keep them within the school system, within the education system, and to get them out to the communities who really need their, their support. Schools, of course, need to be properly financed. And that's particularly true of poorly performing schools in highly vulnerable and marginalized areas. There are a number of governments across the world that have introduced capitation financing systems. Ghana is a very good example of that, that has increased the resourcing to the poorest parts of the country, the northern Ghana in this case. And that is also starting to show some results, both in terms of the numbers of children in school, but the learning outcomes in the school system uh, as well. If you take the bottom left-hand corner of the triangle, the access and affordability point, what, one of the things that governments can most obviously do to improve affordability is to ensure that children don't have to pay to go to primary school. There's a lot of evidence from across the world that where governments charge kids for going into school, it is a very big deterrent, it creates a very big barrier to entry. But we also know that when that barrier is removed, it can really result in surges into the school system. When Tanzania removed school fees in uh, around 2003, 2004, it led to an increase of around 3 million children going into the school system 
over the next four years. Something broadly similar to that happened uh, at around the same time in Ethiopia. And looking back a little bit further, precisely the same experiences were repeated in countries like Malawi and Uganda. Now, getting more kids into school is clearly a good thing, but when you have a surge in enrollment like that, it can put a, a very great strain on the school infrastructure. Class sizes go up, you can get shortages of, uh, of, of books, of desks, of basic teaching materials, and, and so on. And it's very important, therefore, that governments sequence and plan for these surges. In the case of Ethiopia, there was a very heavy investment put into training teachers in advance and making sure that qualified teachers were available in the first one, in, in the first grade, the second grade, and the third grade. Why, why was it so important to get qualified teachers in those grades? Because the evidence from many countries has shown that when you get these surges, the second that you do an assessment test um, as a condition for going on to the next grade, you can see very big dropout levels. That's still a problem in Uganda, whereas both Tanzania and Ethiopia have avoided that problem precisely by investing far more heavily in getting qualified teachers into the early grades and supporting early grade learning. Um, the broader entitlements and opportunities framework. It, it's not enough in many cases just to take away formal school fees. Things have to be done that protect the most marginal and vulnerable families from the impact of economic shocks. And one of the things that governments can do here is to invest in social protection systems. We've seen evidence from countries like Brazil, uh, and Mexico, and more recently from Ethiopia and Zambia in Sub-Saharan Africa, that targeted support for poor households can enable these very poor, uh, can enable very poor communities to withstand the shocks that might otherwise force them to withdraw their children from school. Legal provisions can be incredibly important. India has produced a law requiring all state governments to provide basic education for children. That was already in the Indian constitution, but it's now part of the legal system. And the children, the, the parents of children who are unable to go to school uh, can, can now actually take out legal action against state governments uh, and, and to demand that they fulfill their obligations un, under uh, a legal entitlement. So the law can also play a, a key role. And we know, of course, from the history of many rich countries, if you think of the civil rights movement in the United States, for example, that legal entitlements can make a very big difference in terms of overcoming social inequalities. Over and above what developing country governments can do and should do to reach their most marginalized citizens, the aid community, the, the international community, also has a critical role to play. Back in 2000, when governments from around the world signed up for the Education for All agenda under a document called the Dakar Framework for Action, there was a pledge made, which, which was actually a, a really critical one and was something of a breakthrough. And the pledge said that no country that is fully committed to achieving the Education for All goals would be allowed to fail for want of finance. That was a commitment from the donor community, from rich countries, not just to developing country governments, but to the children of developing countries. Um, now, that pledge has not been honored, and I want to give you some of the basic indicators for just uh, the, the, for the degree to which it's been broken. Let, in, in our last Education for All Global Monitoring Report, we, we looked at the financing requirements for achieving basic education on some of these key targets that I set out earlier. And we did that for 46 low-income countries. And if you take these countries as a group, the overall financing requirement is somewhere in the order of around 36 billion US dollars. Uh, th these are average annual financing requirements through to 2015. The current resources which are going into basic education in these countries uh, is, 
somewhere in the order of around 12 billion US dollars. If you factor in towards 2015 the additional resources that would be generated by economic growth and the revenue collected from that growth and put back through the national budget into the education system, that would push up the, the financing available by around another three billion. And we, we also estimated that if governments were to strengthen their own revenue raising efforts and provide more equitable public spending with a stronger focus on basic education, something like another four billion could be mobilized. Of course, these numbers all look different for individual countries, but this is averaged out across the, the group of 46 countries. But if you, if you take that financing base, you can see it's an awful long way from where governments need to be in order to deliver on the promise of education for all. In fact, it's around $16 billion away from where it needs to be. And it's this $16 billion we should really provide the benchmark for the international aid effort in education. But if you, if you unpick the international aid effort in education, you, you can see that it's falling an awful long way short from where it needs to be. So current aid to education for those 46 countries that I mentioned for basic education is running at about $3 billion. You, you may remember that back in 2005, rich countries made a number of aid pledges uh, under the Glen Eagles framework and, and other commitments. But even if those pledges were delivered on in full, and the evidence for Sub-Saharan Africa so far is that less than half of the commitment has been delivered, but even if that were changed, it would only deliver another $2 billion. In other words, that leaves us with an aid shortfall for financing in basic education for those 46 low-income countries of around $11 billion annually. That, that's a very small sum of money when you compare it with the money that was pumped into the banking systems of rich countries uh, for the financial rescue package during, the, during the, the financial crisis. It's a tiny sum of money when you compare it from, with global military budgets, but it's a very large chunk of the overall financing that's required in order to move us towards this ambition of education for all by 2015. If you look behind, again, behind this, this headline number to the performance of individual donors, um, aid for education is partly a function of the overall aid effort, and it's partly a function of how much of the overall aid effort goes into the education system. If you look at the overall aid effort, you, you can see there's a very variable level of performance uh, among donors. Um, th this is measuring aid as a percentage of gross national income. And you can see that it ranges from almost 1% or around 1% in the case of Norway to well, to well under 0.2% in the case of other, uh, in the case of ma some major G8 economies like the United States, Italy, and Japan. Many of these donors have set individual targets or adopted group-based targets for increasing their aid effort. These blue dots give you an indication of where the bar has been set. Um, as you can see, some donors who are scoring pretty low on the share of national income that's going into aid have set the bar quite high, like Italy. Others have set it very low, like the United States. But if you look at how countries are performing against where they've set the bar, in some cases uh, there's really almost no progress, uh, like uh, as with the case of Italy. In, in others, there's more progress in countries like Spain, the United Kingdom, France, and Germany. But the overall story here is, is one of an impending shortfall. The commitment to double aid to Sub-Saharan Africa will not materialize if donors carry on as they are. And that has huge implications for the financing gap that I outlined a little bit earlier. There's a, there are trends in aid to education are a source of, of rising concern. In 2006 and uh, leading into 2007, we saw 
a big decline in aid commitments to education, which you can see picked up in, in this graph here. And the, the decline was particularly marked in the case of, uh, of, of basic education. And this year we've updated these figures to look at actual delivery and that uh, stagnation has been continued. Now, if you look at these trends against the financing gap numbers that I outlined earlier, you, you can really see we're an awful long, there's, there's a very large deficit between what the donor community is actually doing and what it promised to do back in 2000. And closing that deficit at a time of fiscal stress in rich countries obviously poses, uh, raises a, a lot of tough political questions. It raises questions of prioritization and some governments, the United Kingdom in particular, has made very strong commitments to keep to its pre-crisis aid commitment targets and is, is aiming to achieve the 0 0.7 uh, target by 2013. That is to say to spend 0.7% of national income on aid by, by 2013. Other major G7 countries are in danger of missing that target, uh, France and, uh, and Germany uh, in particular. And another group of countries, major G8 economies, the United States, Italy and Japan, are really signaled that uh, they're, they're now extremely unlikely to be moving towards the targets on, on anything like the scale required. It raises the question, of course, of do we need to look beyond traditional aid, bilateral aid, uh, national aid that goes through the multilateral system to more innovative sources of financing. In the health sector, there's been quite a strong record of performance on mobilizing new resources through facilities like the Global Fund, for example, uh, for tackling HIV and AIDS, for the Gavi initiative to support uh, vaccination financing. So far, we've seen really nothing like that in education. And I, I, I th it seems to me there's a real opportunity there to start tapping into innovative financing resources and getting it into the education system. L looking beyond the headline numbers on aid, there's another set of issues that really need to be addressed urgently. What, one of those issues is about the predictability of aid. It's absolutely critical for education planners in poor countries that you know how much aid is going to be coming into the system over the next three to four to five years. And that's for a very obvious reason, that if you recruit teachers today, you still need, you need to be paying them in three, four and five years time. Unfortunately, much of the aid that's committed to low income countries and in particular into education has a very high level of variability and volatility attached to it, which makes planning very difficult. There's also a tendency on the part of many donors to work outside of the government budget system and the government financial planning system, which is undermining efforts to build capacity in education. And there are whole groups of countries that are being either bypassed by the aid system or not sufficiently supported. And that's uh, especially true of conflict affected countries and countries that are emerging from conflict. So I've, I've tried to set out during the lecture some of the things that governments and aid donors can do to tackle the problem. And just to summarize the, the broad framework, um, I think there are six key points that need to be made. The, the, the first is that education is a basic human right. The feature of a basic human right is that it's a, a right for everybody in society. What you achieve in education and your opportunities in education shouldn't be determined by the wealth of the household that you're born into. It shouldn't be determined by the color of your skin or the language that you happen to speak or your gender or where you happen to live. And that's why we've been arguing in the UNESCO Education for All Global Monitoring Report for equity-based targets. These could be targets that are supplementary to the Millennium Development Goals, which might include a provision like halving the gap in school attendance between the wealthiest children from the wealthiest households and the poorest households, halving the gap between the rural parts of a country and the urban areas of, of a country. Setting such a target would be important symbolically because it would be sending a signal 
that we care about equity. We don't just care about the national average. But it would also help to turn the political spotlight on those groups that are being left behind, the groups that uh, are picked up in our deprivation and marginalization in education indicator. A second absolute priority is to strengthen the commitment to quality. At the moment, we're achieving far more progress on the headcount indicators of advance. We're getting more children into school, we're getting more children through primary school, and we're getting more children into secondary school. That's all positive. But far too many children are still coming out of primary school, lacking the basic tools that they need, the literacy tools, the numeracy, the, the numeracy tools, the reasoning tools, and the, and the broader problem-solving competencies that they need to realize their potential. International learning assessments can give us a window on the scale of the problem and the global inequalities in this area. But what is really needed is national and local learning assessments that gives us a clearer picture of where children are. But critically, those assessments have to be linked to the building of capacity, the training of teachers, the provision of learning devices in order to raise overall quality standards. It's especially important that we tackle this problem early. Um, early learning assessments and early learning support is, 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 is key here, because if you fall behind in those first two or three years in primary school, it's increasingly difficult to catch up. And again, we've seen from a number of countries that concentrating resources in the early years can really make a difference in terms of raising overall learning achievement levels. It's, it's important when we look at a problem like marginalization in education, not to think in silos. It's seldom the case that children who are being left behind in school face one problem. They carry with them into school the underlying structures of disadvantage that they experience in their households. Disadvantages of poverty, disadvantages of discrimination, in some cases based on the color of their skin, in some cases based on the language they happen to speak, the group that they happen to belong to. There are issues of stigmatization and self-confidence. And it's important that policymakers, when they think about strategies for closing gaps and enabling the marginalized to catch up, that they tackle all of these problems simultaneously. Of course, that's a tough thing to do, but thinking in boxes and operating in silos isn't going to solve the problem. In many countries, governments, even governments that are strongly committed to the to the goals of the Education for All agenda and to the Millennium Development Goals lack the capacity to deliver the resources and the financing and the services that are needed to give kids a chance to deliver on the right to education. But in many of these countries, we, we're seeing non-government organizations, community-based organizations stepping up to the plate. And in cases like Bangladesh, in Zambia, in Tanzania, these organizations are, are, are often reaching children who are highly marginalized, children who are living in slums, in the case of Bangladesh, living on riverbanks, providing training, but also through cooperation with government, operating on the national curriculum and getting those kids back into the school system. And it's important, I think, that governments and NGOs work in partnership, that they, that they operate in tandem and they don't operate on separate tracks. Um, increasing resource mobilization. E every country, re resource mobilization is another key issue. Of course, every country in the world has to determine its own priorities, but many countries are attaching far too little weight to education. India is spending less than 3% of national income on education. That is too little, and ultimately it'll backfire because it will hold back employment creation and economic growth in, in India. It'll certainly hold back efforts to create a more broad-based, equitable pattern of income distribution. There are many things that governments can do to expand financing for education. It's partly about broadening the tax base. It's partly about determining or redefining priorities between areas like military spending and spending on school systems. 
But we also need to see the donor community stepping up to the plate and delivering on the commitments that, that it made. We're currently facing an overall financing gap in education be beyond that, that particular group of countries that I outlined earlier of around $13 billion annually. That's a small sum compared to what rich countries spent bailing out their banks, but it could make an awful, an awful lot of difference to the lives of those 50 million children who will still be out of school in 2015 if we don't fix the system and put in place the financing now. So we need to honour those uh, overall financing commitments. The last point to make on all of this is that this is not a problem for tomorrow. We are now less than one primary school generation away from breaking the promise that was made back in 2000 to deliver decent quality, basic education for every child in the world. We can't wait until 2013 or 2015 to put in place the investments that are needed to provide education for all by, by 2015. We need to do it now, we need to act with urgency, and we need to keep the promise that was made to the world's children. Thank you very much.